So this is the PowerPoint from last time. And I'm just gonna go, go, go. By the way, I wanna say really, really nice work in identifying underlying assumptions in Bar Baron and Grimm. Um, it can be hard to identify what the author assumes an audience already believes the attitudes, the values that they're holding. And so, uh, um, yeah, it can be really hard to do that. And you did an extraordinary job. You identified underlying assumptions that I hadn't even thought of. I thought of the basic ones, but um, not all of them. You also did a really good job of identifying types of topics that we could enter into. And I was gonna put you back in your groups so that you could sort of narrow them down. But I looked at what you had done and it seems like you're all on pretty much the same page. Um, I see a lot of discussions of colorblindness, the role of productive diversity. I mean, productive diversity is awareness of diversity that leads to social change. So it isn't just awareness, it's not just theoretical, but it actually does something. And a lot of times, a lot of times, um, institutions in particular will focus on awareness or theoretical diversity. And Baron and Grimm wanted something that was productive diversity, it was doing something to lead to social change systemic racism and since the creation of the writing center um, systemic racism has been going on for as long as this country has been existing so the writing center is just one more um, manifestation of that racism in the teaching of literacy i thought this was it really interesting um, conversational patterns understanding what makes up the new racism um, I, you'll see a lot of the same things here, this discussion of colorblindness, the avoidance of talking about racism. I like how they, um, uh, group two kind of defined things. You'll notice that uh, as I, I narrowed down the topics and I have a slide here, um, we, oops. I wanted to have this one. Uh, the story, the narrative, we wanna think about what that narrative is about uh, because we can't write a whole research paper on a single narrative that happened 20 years ago, but we can think about what this is about. And this African-American writing center coach, the student who was working with um, Baron, she was feeling, um, she was feeling isolated in the, in university life, not so much the center because she was being really honest with Baron, but in her writing class, she didn't feel like she could be honest where she could write the things that were really important. And this stems back to systemic racism or institutional racism. Those things are really linked. Um, that makes people feel marginalized. And uh, so, you know, like marginalization might be of students in literacy education, that might be a good topic. Um, so you see, there are a lot of things. They seem to be all focused on the same ideas. And I really appreciated this because it seemed like, um, it, it made me see that you're really understanding what Baron and Graham are doing and what they're talking about and where these conversations have headed over time. Um, and so what I did here is I sort of took what you focused on and I created several categories. Are there any, I mean, I have the effect of colorblindness on literacy education, deculturization, 
which is um, decentering whiteness and um, white culture standard, what used to be considered American culture when, you know, like it, there weren't a lot of, um, I, I'm not sure how, um, when whiteness was being American, um, which it never was, but it's how culture was set up. Uh, that's when institutions like the university were set up. And so whiteness, white ways of being were at the center. And so deculturalization is taking whiteness out of the center um, and allowing other places. So it's decentering or deculturalization. The new racism and its impact on literacy education, looking for more subtle forms of racism, um, working with non-native speakers of English, development of productive diversity in the writing center, tutor training on diversity, the role of language difference in literacy education. I see I spelled education incorrectly. This is the idea of code switching or multiple Englishes um, versus writing white and um, or institutional racism and its effect on literacy education. Let me, uh, are there any things that you would, we're gonna vote on what we want our six topics to be. Are there any that I didn't include on this list from that's, you know, like, cause I was summarizing what you had. Is there anything I didn't include that you think I should include before we vote? I think that's a, a that's a tough question to cover personally um i just thought i'd say that because um you have a, a lot listed here which is really helpful but i always feel that whenever we're writing about a specific topic even one of the ones listed um sometimes we think of new ideas while we're writing that and then we branch off to it and i don't know if that's allowed or if we really should be focusing on sticking as close to one of these topics as possible well, I see, here's the thing with that, Derek, and I think that this is going to allow you that flexibility, is these topics are still broad enough that as you start reading and understanding colorblindness, and you'll see, you'll narrow the topic very specifically. These are all way too broad to write a seven-page research paper on. And so you would find one effect of colorblindness and colorblindness has a lot of avenues as does deculturalization or the new racism or working with non-native speakers or tutor training on diversity. Um, there's a lot here. And so you will have that flexibility as we move forward to stay connected to the topic you choose, even if it's only tangentially. Does that, sort of answer your question, Derek? Yeah, then uh, I guess my answer to your original question would be, I think this covers a wide enough range that if we're allowed to, to go into subsets, it, it'll be fine. And there's a lot of overlap on this yeah. as well. Um, okay, let me, let's then vote. Um, I put together a poll and, um, Choose the top three, the ones that you think are the most, you're most interested in choosing. Um, I listed all of these here. Can you see these now? Okay, choose your top three.
Okay, I think just about everybody has voted. Oh dear, what happened to the poll? I made it go away. So everybody's voted. Can you see these poll resort, resort, results? Okay, good, good, good. Um, it looks like I should have had a piece. Oh, I have some paper. I am reorganizing where my desk is. And so, yeah, I'm really bored in my house these days. So colorblindness seems to be a top one. And the next is the role of language difference. And the next one is institutional racism. Deculturalization. And one, two, three, four, um, non native speakers. And literacy and um, the new racism are tied. Okay. Yes. All right. That was easy. All right. Now I'm, it's like a lot of moving pieces. What I'm going to do right now is pull up. a sign up sheet that I'm going to topic one is going to be colorblindness. Topic two is language difference. This is like code switching. Um, number three is institutional racism and the teaching of um, and the teaching of literacy, education, deculturization, um, working with non-native speakers. I see that I've spelled that incorrectly, but we're just gonna go with it. And I'm gonna put NNS here for better yet, let's just do this. And then topic six is uh, the new racism. Okay. What I wanna do right now, I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna send you the link for this so that you can sign up right now. We're limiting it to, there's so much overlap here that I'm limiting it to five people in a group. That's a good amount of people that you can, um, you know, like talk to each other, get to know each other, give each other feedback, support each other without it getting too big. Beyond five, we're really pushing that. Um, okay, there's 28 of us. So there will be some groups that only have four. So, um, so it'll be groups of four to five. So I've sent you that link and you can go ahead and um, start signing up for a group. I know, such pressure. Let's 
see, that's four, nine, 13, 15, 17, 18. A few of you have not yet signed up. Adrian, you're sort of all, all by yourself with the new racism. Is there anyone who hasn't signed up yet? There are 24 of us and 5, 10, 14, 19, 22, 23. One person I think has not signed up. So let me, um, I want you to have some time in your groups, but I want to share one more thing with you. Um, any questions about what we're doing so far? Is the thing we're talking to our group about, like um, we each go and find different like articles to use for the bibliography? So just like doing research together? Yeah, you're doing research together, but you're also serving each as, as you're as you're creating that annotated bibliography you're giving each other feedback. Oh, that doesn't make sense. Or I read that article and I don't think that's what it says. Or I think you're gonna need more development on, on this idea so that they can revise before I'm actually grading it, oh, if wow. that makes sense. Um, but then when you start drafting, you're peer reading groups for each other. And um, not that you'll have to read four people's work, because that would be a little excessive, but um, you all can figure out how you want to do this most effectively. Let me share one other thing with you. Um, something that I wish I had finished, but I did not finish. This is a sample annotated bibliography, and it's not really finished right now, but it will be later today. Do you all see this document? Yes. Yes. Kristen, can you nod yes or no? And I see your cat has joined you today. Yeah, he's not my cat. He's my neighbor's. Oh, I was going to say introduce us to your cat, but <laughs> it's um he's Panther. He's very friendly. He doesn't spend time at the neighbor's house, only here. <laughs> I'm surprised they're not concerned about coyotes. Um, I don't, we don't really have coyotes in my neighborhood. There's like, maybe a raccoon would be like the scariest thing, but also like panther will like beat people up sometimes. So we don't really have to worry. Yeah, I live in a condo in La Mesa and sometimes we've seen Coyotes in the green space. We know they're all over because we can see coyote <laughs> scat, uh, with that, which is probably more information than you wanted. So anyways, um, so when we get this, you're going to have um, one person from your group is going to control the document um, so that so you'll create a copy and then you'll share it with everybody in your group and me list your group members and then here's your big picture research question because all of the topics that we have are answering how does diversity affect literacy education they're all answering that question so we start with this very big picture topic about literacy education and diversity and we narrow it down to colorblindness, which is another way of viewing 
diversity or understanding diversity. And so what is the impact of colorblindness on literacy education? And at some point, if this is your topic, you would narrow it even more is how does the, it might be something, how does the reluctance to even think about or talk about race impact literacy education? In fact, um, I think I told you when I was teaching um, personal essays last spring, I realized toward the end of the semester that there were probably only in that list that I got, a, a list that I found on the internet of 40 different personal essays, maybe only four of them were from people of color and less than 30% um, were by women. And I was like, whoa, I didn't even know, notice that. And so colorblindness means we don't notice things. I changed it in the summer and started pulling out, you know, like other essays. Um, it took me a long time to find them because, um, you know, like sometimes it's hard to find these things, but that doesn't mean it's not important. So, so it's going really broad, going more narrow, more narrow. Definitely the African American writing coach, the story that Baron begins with in the article we read. That's a story that illustrates colorblindness. And because of colorblindness, that writing center coach felt reluctant to share her perspective because it wouldn't reflect the colorblindness. It would just sort of interrupt that and, and she felt very strange about that. So there are lots of ways to look at that. So you're gonna name your, like name, name your topic here. And then I want you in your groups to come up with as many questions as you can think of, or as many ways to approach this as you can think of. And then I want you to think about um, like, what are some kinds of information that you will need to know? And this is preliminary. The more you read on this, the more you understand it, the more you're gonna recognize. For example, you might say, we need to know what are graduation rates? What are enrollment rates in universities? What are enrollment rates of people of color in two-year institutions versus four-year institutions? A CSU versus a UC? What are those statistics? And what are the graduation rates? And how long do they take to graduate? And do they get, I mean, like, do you see how you're gonna need statistics as well as research? And the more you learn, the more you'll need, realize you need to know. So I would imagine that these research questions that you're asking and the kinds of information that you'll need, you'll be adding to that and you're collaborating. So you're saying, oh, I'm gonna find that or let's, um, I'm staring at Anna and Kristen and Reese, and if they were in the same group, which I know they're not, they might be asking, saying, hey, two of you, look, look at finding these. Find your keywords, do that research. And then comes the annotated bibliography. And I, what I don't have is a sample from Baron and Grimm, but each, I will have that, and you'll be able to see how I write. So every annotated bibliography needs to have the following things. The name of the student who created the entry, obviously, because you get credit for that. And I wanna give individual grades rather than group grades. Your groups are to support each other. And build relationship, get to know each other, get to know about things that you all care about which I think is helpful in this kind of thing. Very rarely do scholars produce information individually. Um, and then you need an MLA formatted citation. And some of you seem to really be getting the hang of this. 
And others of you seem to still be struggling with that. Help each other out. Um, even if it's you know, like talking about, hey, you need hanging indentation. Do you know how to do that? Oh, here's a YouTube video on how to do that. Um, it wouldn't be complete without a pricey. Yay. Um, sometimes, sometimes you're going to be less interested in the overall argument of an article and just on a claim. So you can use that pricey to introduce a claim. Um, and how the author develops that claim as well as the purpose of the, that claim. In sentence four, make sure that you are identifying an underlying assumption of the primary audience. So it might be, as in Baron and Grimm, um, Baron and Grimm use a thoughtful, reflective tone to connect with their audience of writing center administrators who share concerns about diversity and want to see social change in the university. Um, so that's the pricey. Sometimes you're gonna read data on surveys or, um, or you're gonna read data, you know, like statistics. For example, if you find a source that has graduation rates, it's probably not in an argument, it's probably from some data source. It would be impossible to write a pricey for that. So you're gonna to wanna to write a concise summary that introduces that data. You also want to have paragraphs that describe how the author develops key claims from the text. And these would in identify the claim, analyze how the author builds that claim, and include any evidence or narratives. That means you're going to have the significance of that claim, why it matters, the evidence, how the evidence, how and why the evidence deepens your understanding of the topic, as well as how it would be relevant to the primary audience. You should include relevant quotations integrated carefully with in-text documentation and analysis of why this matters. At times, you might be paraphrasing narratives that the authors use to illustrate their claims. So you need to be sure if you're summarizing, for example, if you were summarizing the narrative that Baron tells about the African-American writing coach, you would say this illustrates the claim that, and it illustrates many claims, but you would be identifying those and how they're relevant to your topic. Um, and at times, the quotation that you find is gonna be the most important thing. I think the information about productive diversity in Baron and Grimm um, is really, really powerful. This differentiation between theory and practice, that might be your focus. That might be why you think that source is so powerful. And so you're introducing it and analyzing it. Ultimately, you would want to find, you know, like where did that source actually come from? And then you would be able to cite that one. Um, Sometimes statistics that an author provides are the most important thing. So you can introduce them, analyze them. Why do they matter? Any questions about this, what we're doing right here? Um, yeah, I'm still a little confused about, are you saying that each, like, each source that we have, we're writing like a multiple paragraphs on that source or? A precy and at least one paragraph. Okay, um, the paragraph just has to include like one of these um, uh, prompts, I guess I should say, right? Well, you definitely wanna talk about significance of the claim, why it matters. You definitely need to include quotations and analysis of those quotations or narratives, you would still need quotations. Um, so this is what goes in those paragraphs. Okay. I know okay, this seems, it. yeah, I know this seems like a lot of work. It's like, hey, it's an annotated bibliography. Why do I need to write, you know, like what could end up being a full page? It's because when you do this, when you actually think about it, um, 
not only are you helping your group out by showing them how this is relevant, but you are, sorry, I'm gonna choke, um, maybe. Um, but you're also deepening your own understanding. And ultimately, a lot of my students find that these annotated bibliographies, they're able to lift the paragraphs that they've written and just tweak them a little bit and use them in their essays. Um, that's not always going to be true. Sometimes you're going to find a source that you, um, that you decide not to use. That's fine. Um, your group members cannot use what you have written, but it guides them into the parts of the text that they think that might be most might be that might be useful to them. Is that a little clear? Any other questions about this? Um, I have a question too. Sorry if you already um, addressed this, but I know that each or a person in the group should do about six entries. Are we putting them all on like one doc together or are we each submitting our own document? You're going to submit it as a group. And that's why at the beginning, yeah, you're each doing six. And so, you know, like some of you, um, you know, like make sure that one person doesn't only find statistics and the rest of everybody is uh, stuck with deeper articles and journal articles, you know, like share the work fairly. Um, so you each need to create at least six entries. And, um, but it's all going to be on one document. So this is going to be a long document. Um, and I'll look at it, evaluate it. Um, I'd like to be able to tell you this is worth X number of points. Right now, I think it's worth 50 points. So it's not a lot. Um, some of you will even be able to, you know, like in your groups, you might say, um, which article did you read um, for the last journal article? And um, some of you may have read duplicate ones. That means only one of you will be able to use that information in here. So, you know, like talk about that. Um, other questions? How is there? Is, a, oh, go ahead, Kristen. Okay. Is there a specific like place to find articles? Oh, you should like explain like, are we just going off into the internet somewhere? No, you don't have to go off into the internet. And I should have, I should have said this already. I think I alluded to it on Monday. Next Monday, next Monday, we're going to meet together for library instruction. The library has a database um, and the library, one of the librarians will talk to us about how to find sources, books, journal articles, newspaper, uh, newspaper articles, statistics um, on the internet um, through the database. And that actually saves you a lot of time because you'll have better sources than if you just go off into Google. Google has a lot of weird stuff on it. A lot of wonderful stuff too, but definitely weird stuff, yeah. Any other questions? Sorry, I have a small question. Yeah. I just noticed on our uh, assignments in Canvas, so this is due on the 31st, right? Because I noticed that the, the annotated, annotated bibliography. Yes. It cannot possibly be due on the 31st. Okay. Um, yeah, because yeah. I was sitting here and I was like, oh man, I have yeah. to do a lot of reading really fast. Okay. Uh, no, um, definitely, definitely not. That that would just be unkind. That would be cruel. And I would be asking you to do it before you even um, learned how to use the database. Uh, clearly, I'm going to have to change that. And oh, here's what I want to do. So what I'm doing right now is I lost you all. I'm sending you oh, 
come on. I cannot. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send you into groups. We have eight minutes, which is not a lot of time. Um, Adrian, I'm gonna put you into group three for now. When I clicked on the link, it says it like wouldn't do it. It says okay. unable to open file. Okay, let me um, 